Hello and welcome back to another update where I cover the latest developments throughout the front line in the Russo Ukrainian war. It is your host Weep Union, and in this one we start out in the southern direction of Vladar, where the Russians have managed to advance in the direction of the southwest of the coal mine number three. The Russians are here moving towards the Ukrainian road, here moving through the north of Vladar. At the same time, the Russians have also advanced west of coal mine number one. Again, this is on the flanks of Vladar with the objective of gaining control over the supply lines and physically cutting off the exit out of Vladar. The Ukrainians are actively launching counterattacks to the northern parts by the garages to clear up some space for the Ukrainians to exit the city during nighttime specifically but really all throughout the day as well, as they wanted to save as many soldiers as they can out of this cauldron. However, the Russians are able to heavily bombard the Ukrainian positions, leaving little to no escape for the Ukrainian soldiers within Volodar. In the Kurapova section of the front line, the Russians have managed to push here northwest of Ukrainsk in the southern flank of Selidove. With this duplicated footage, we see that the Russians are flanking Selidove from the south, reaching the southwestern parts of the city in an attempt to flank the Ukrainian positions. The Russian objective with such operations, as we have seen with this type of settlements, is that the Russians want to expand the front line as much as possible. This is due to the fact that there is a shallow part and a wide part to this sort of settlement. The Russians are currently fighting in a circular way where they are fighting against the Ukrainians both to the northeast, east and southeast. They are now expanding this to the south and southwest with this assault here flanking the Ukrainian positions and following some recent captures here west of Novorodivka, it is likely that they will expand it to the northern parts and northwestern parts as well. The objective is to bypass the town itself hitting its supply lines and limiting the supplies that goes through it. It also serves to expand the front line to a wider scale where the Russians can make use of their numerical superiority and the wider they are spread out, the more options the Russians have to attack from multiple directions and therefore be less predictable. This has allowed the Russians to expand their zone of control here south of Selidove to accompany the first lines here to the south of the city. We also see the Russian foothold in the railways, which will likely be expanded with this assault to push to in the direction of Vishneve. This will cut off supplies southwest of Selidove, and with a push from the west of Novrodivka, they can reach the E50 highway or push from the direction of Marinivka as well to hit the supplies going into Selidove from the north. A continuous push in the direction of Vishneve and to the E50 highway to the northwest of Selidove will physically encircle Selidove. And we can see on my map there is really no Ukrainian position that is well prepared to hold back such a push in the northern flank. There's no fortified positions, there's no natural barriers, and there's no settlements. In the southern flank, the Russians can advance through the railways to then reach Vishneve, which is the only settlement. And again, there's no natural barriers, there's no fortified positions. The Ukrainian positions here by Selidove is extremely vulnerable following the Russian capture of the fortified positions east of the city. And this has allowed the Russians to gain a significant advantage over the fight over the city of Selidove. In the Pokrovsk section of the front line, the Russians are storming Sukhoyar to the south, where there is this geolocated footage, confirming the Russian advance into the first line south of Sukhoyar and breaching the Ukrainian defensive line south of the settlement. So we see that the Russians are not only storming Sukhoyar and Lesivka to the west of Novrodivka, they are also pushing here north of Krochiyar, west of Kresnyar to attack the fortified positions of the Ukrainians here west of these settlements across the river line and they've also managed to capture a forest patch part of Mykolaivka here to the north of Krasnoyar securing the fortified positions that they recently captured and pushing into the western parts of the small town. There is this fortified position northwest of Mykolaivka that the Russians also have to gain control of but that would lead to the Russians having full control over the fortified positions in between Novorodivka and Mernorad, 
there is uh, this line here this is anti-tank concrete blocks such as the dragon teeth which has been seen with video footage in the ukrainian kursk offensive that these can be removed by engineering vehicles and pushed to the side at the same time we've also seen footage of this exact line where the dragon teeth do not even cover the road they just cover the areas around the roads that means that the roads are completely free of these uh, dragon teeth that doesn't mean that the ukrainians can't fix this part once they withdraw from these fortified positions north of no uh, rodivka however this also just shows that the ukrainian positions here near Mirnorod are vulnerable and if the Russians can control the remaining parts of the fortified positions, they can also advance through the railways into Mirnorod. In either case, the Battle of Mirnorod may begin very soon. And this is why the Russians conducted their rotation of forces once they captured Novorodivka, because they saw they were at the gates of Pokrovsk and Mirnorod, and therefore they could not make use of soldiers who have been fighting all the way from Avdivka to this point, they had to rotate out entire brigades and divisions to have fresh units come in and fight this new part, the new phase of the Battle of Pokrovsk, the battle over the city itself. And this is why we're now seeing that the remaining parts of the fortified line in between that of the Russian positions and Pokrovsk is now being fought over. The Russians are here looking to cut off the road to Selidove from the north, forcing a Ukrainian withdrawal from the city. And at the same time, they are looking to storm Mirnorod ahead of storming Pokrovsk, to cut off the road east of Pokrovsk towards Kosentinivka, and to allow for flanking maneuvers in the direction of the highway intersection here to the northwest of Novoalexandrivka. So we see generally the Russians are starting a new large-scale operation in the direction of Pokrovsk following their switch to the southern flank south of Ukrainsk, where fighting is now taking place in the direction of Selidove, Hirnik, and the entire pocket of Ukrainian forces here northeast of Kuropove. This means we have three separate offensive operations we have covered in this video so far. The battle over Volodar, the battle over Kuropove, and the battle over Pokrovsk. We then move on to the Toretsk section of the front line where the Russians have advanced yet again in these forest lines here to the south of Toretsk. The Russians will now do some positional fighting to gain full control over the forest patches, forest area here south of Toretsk, and then connect the two sides between the southern flank and the central flank of the Battle of Toretsk. At the same time, the Russians are moving through the residential area in the eastern parts of Toretsk, where the objective is to gain control over the entire city itself. So this is a battle towards that. The main defensive positions of the Ukraines remaining under their control is the industrial area and the hills here to the west of the city, the remaining parts of the apartment complex area in the central parts of the city, and the industrial zone in the northern parts of the city. Then there are a few hills and fortified positions here and there. The fortified positions in the rear of Toretsk are positions that are prepared to hold Toretsk after the loss of Toretsk, meaning that it, their objective of the fortified positions is to prevent the Russians from making much use of the capture of Toretsk, but instead to bombard any Russian positions within Toretsk following the Russian capture of it. So these Positions were really thought to, if the Russians take control over Toretsk, we'll still be able to contain them in one way or another, and the Ukrainians have two lines of defense for that. And this is exactly why the Donetsk region is so difficult for the Russians to take control of. They simply have a hundred backup plans in terms of fortified positions, but as we can clearly see, beyond the Donetsk region, beyond the Zaporizhia region, there is hardly any fortified positions of the Ukrainians made. In the Kursk section of the front line, there is reports that the Russians have started storming the village of Svetlikovo, which is the one that is the main high hub or the area where the Russians can cut off the road between Sutsha and Olgovka near the front line. The cutting off or the control over Svetlikovo would cut off the majority of supplies going anywhere in the western parts of Svetlikovo, and this will significantly improve the situation for the Russian soldiers in this section of the front line, connecting between the two. 
So we see that the Russian objective here is gain control over the settlement, hit the supplies of the Ukrainians, take advantage of that to secure the western flank of the Ukrainian Kursk offensive, and then push towards Sucha directly to gain control over the settlement and cut off all supplies to the remaining section of the Kursk front line. And that is going to be all for this update. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and check out our Patreon for additional content as well as YouTube membership. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.